look at uh, Index containers, uh, which uh, was uh, you know, mostly the, the stuff of, uh, of a buffer under run. Uh, so I did various things uh, live at the keyboard. Uh, I just drawing your attention uh, to the fact that the notes have become uh, more substantial uh, in respect of, uh, of index containers. And I just sort of like, whizzed through um, edited highlights of those things. So we looked at index containers and the corresponding notion of tree structure and we rebuilt various things we like. Uh, and then I introduced uh, this uh, data type of, uh, of descriptions, uh, which is essentially uh, a way of trying to talk about uh, yeah, there's the syntax of data type declarations. So there's some hand stuff for you here to do, for example, to show that, uh, that although uh, descriptions can be given a direct interpretation, um, where uh, the, uh, for example, the product descriptions are a description of a product. Um, uh, so yeah, so we get a kind of richer collection of uh, of, of type forms coming out in a direct interpretation. Nonetheless, everything you can describe this way is up to isomorphism an index container. So here's the exercise to, to show that uh, by saying, well, you know, okay, so just give it a type of shape, a type of positions. Um, so yeah, so we're just we're just looking at uh, pragmatically convenient more intentional presentations of index containers, but there's nothing kind of fundamentally new or different now. Uh, there's some exercises in describing data types, there's an exercise in describing the data type of descriptions, um, and there's uh, a little bit of an exploration of how to establish once and for all, an induction principle good for uh, every describable type. Well, here's the container version, but then the, um, the, uh, the version for uh, descriptions is, uh, is an exercise for you to, to define you know, the induction principle with the motivation that uh, if you were building a type theory in which all data types were describable, then you would equip it with this one primitive induction principle, and that would be that. Right? All other programs would elaborate, all recursive programs would elaborate in terms of this one induction principle. So you could treat pattern matching as outside the core functionality. Just say there's this one recursion operator which does the right thing for every type that you can describe. Um, that's where you know, I'd like to take things, is sort of in the direction of, of closed type theories that you know, reflect the, the functionality that may be available to you, that you just write down a final presentation of it. And draw a line under it. But, um, um, yeah. That's um, uh, fun to be had. Uh, oh yes, here's a nice thing. So remember, we took um, uh, we took fixed points of containers and they gave us W types, but W types were not containers. But now we can take fixed points of indexed containers, and they are indexed containers. So here, if we want to make a container uh, for J-indexed structures <coughs> with I-indexed nodes, or with I-indexed elements rather, J-indexed structures, I-indexed elements, and we want to make it a recursively defined container, then we have to say what its node structures are, and what are they? They are J-indexed 
structures with element positions either for recursive substructures J indexed or elements uh, which are I indexed. So what we say is, well, okay, the substructures are either children or, uh, uh, or elements and indexed accordingly. So uh, that's sort of one of the, the nice things about moving to the index settings is that more of the structure that containers possess, uh, yeah, more of those structures become closure properties for index containers. You, you, um, you don't get pushed out of, of the world of index containers nearly so easily. And here, taking fixed points is, uh, is one of those things. And another, oh yeah, so here's, a, here's an amusing little exercise uh, is what happens if you then try and add an internal fixed point operator to to task. Uh, you can do it. Building the induction principle is quite challenging. Uh, uh, but you know, have a go if you think you're hard enough. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, yes, uh, I thought we should. Uh, I should mention this, and leave this for you to explore, uh, which is that um, the, uh, the notion of a, a one-hole context uh, makes perfect sense uh, for an indexed container. And you get uh, uh, a Jacobian matrix of partial derivatives. Right, so, um, uh, when you have a, a, a function from vectors to vectors, which is essentially what we've got is that these things, these indexed sets are generalized vectors. We get one branch for each index. So if we want to say, uh, what does it mean to have a one whole context in a, a J indexed structure with I indexed elements? Well, we're going to have to specify the index of the structure and the index of the whole. So we'll get a, a matrix of partial derivatives. One for each kind of structure we could be making a hole in, and one for each kind of hole we could be making. Yeah. So, um, uh, you yeah. know, thank goodness we teach vector calculus in computer science undergraduates. <laughs> <laughs> we do, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Um, Indirect to natural sciences trials. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so there's sort of fun stuff uh, with, with zippers there. And then I ask you to do the same thing for descriptions. Uh, so, yeah, so here for these things, for index containers, it's more like saying directly what happens with the power series representation. And then for descriptions, it's much more like um, uh, defining the laws for each of the type forming constructs. So you, so you get to write a program which Leibniz wrote in the 17th century and uh, my dad wrote in 1970. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, I mean it's just the same, the same program, but then you get to interpret it in an amusing way. Um, uh, what else? Maxwell's <laughs> 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 equations, that would be good. No, I still don't know what my son What curl is. Uh, uh, but, uh, yes. Yeah, div makes perfect sense. Uh, but, um, but curl is. Uh, well, it's the same way as subtraction, which is not a completely ridiculous. No. Um, anyway, um, I wanted to do a little bit of stuff about how um, there are um, uh, uh, there are other ways to um, to cook up uh, notions of index containers. Um, this is um, an alternative language for panel reasons we call Roman containers um, uh, where uh, uh, it, you start with a plain container, just SP 
and then you explain how to mark up the bits, the indices. You explain how to assign an index to each shape, and how to, uh, that's to say, a, a node structure to each shape, and how to um, assign a, an index to each child position. Uh, and these correspond much more closely to the way we write down data type declarations in ACTA or COC, in that when, when you write down a data declaration, you say what the choice of constructors is, and then you say both which indices you ask for in recursive positions and which indices you deliver in the constructor return type. So these are a kind of more direct model of that mode of uh, defining data types, which is why I used to like it and don't anymore. Um, but yeah, there's some amusing exploration in terms of just sort of turning things in and out of Roman form. Uh, and yes, it's very easy to see uh, why um, the fixed points of, um, uh, of Roman containers uh, can be expressed in terms of ordinary W types. So where previously in this chapter we introduced the Peterson CNET trees of indexed tree structures built by indexed containers, turns out we didn't need to do that we could have built all of those structures from plain unindexed W types subject to constraints. Uh, I'm not saying it's a good idea to do it, but the point is just that adding, uh, adding the indexing doesn't give you any extra expressive power on top of just having the notion of W type. It just gives you easier access to the precision of index. And then, why did you use like it and not like it now? Actually, that's more or less the subject of the next lecture. <laughs> but, uh, um, uh, at least it, it'll, it'll come out in that wash. Uh, uh, it's also partly to do with uh, uh, a, a developing tendency towards sort of religious bidirectionalism. Um, <laughs> that's to say, I expect that when I'm type checking data in a data type, the type is being pushed in, uh, and the index for the data type is known. So why would I choose a formulation in which the constructor tells me what index it delivers, when instead I could choose a formulation where Knowing the index already, I can compute what data are permitted. It's just about a better fit with the data flow that now happens. Um, but, you know, that's at least that's that's one motivation. But there is another motivation which will show up uh, in the next lecture, which is to do with equality. Um, okay. Uh, the next bit is a complete red herring, but rather a laugh. Uh, it's a, a define reflective transit of closure and then build lots of our favourite data types as instances of reflective transit of closure. I mean, they'll all be kind of uh, list like things, but you know, many variations on the theme of list can be defined as, uh, as re uh, reflective transit of closure. So if you're worried about the fact, I mean, if you look in the ACTA standard library, I think there are. Uh, last I heard, 18 different list-like data structures, it's probably more now. Uh, uh, so yeah, big, uh, big paranoia about uh, uh, how, to, uh, how to recover some sort of commonality to, to those structures. This is one way of, of looking at um, the list-like structures. Um, and it's quite fun. You sort of, so here, I give you one for nothing. The natural numbers uh, are the um, uh, reflective transitive uh, closure 
uh, on uh, the relation, the binary relation on unit with one edge. <laughs> so, um, uh, but yeah, it's, it's a fun to build the other ones. Uh, right, but um, here is uh, here's a key thing which we will need sooner rather than later, uh, which is uh, uh, to to pay attention to these uh, two presentations of the sort of constructive notion of a subset. Uh, suppose we have some set X. How might we describe uh, subsets of X? Oh. One way is to consider uh, evidence about particular X's. You might want to say, okay, well, if we can explain what extra you would need to know about a given X to convince you that it's not only an X, but it's an X that lives in this subset. Uh, so you might consider that some, some family of types in X Arab set uh, sort of representing uh, the, um, uh, the property of a particular X that you have in mind and then you would uh, represent this subset itself by kind of comprehension. You, you'd uh, have a dependent pair of the element and the proof that it satisfies the property. Um, but that's one way to sort of pick out the subset of X. But another way is just to implement any old function with x as its codomain. Uh, and you are free to choose uh, which elements of x you actually hit with this function. That's to say, uh, choose a set Write a function, choose a set i, and write a function from i to x. That's going to pick out some element of x. It's, actually, it's going to introduce a naming scheme for elements of x that we happen to want to talk about. I mean, you can think of this set i as the set of names for the x's which are in the subset. This making sense? So two ways to pick out a subset. One, by specifying the property that uh, elements of the subset have. Uh, and the other, to introduce a, a naming scheme for them, which, which you can then interpret picking out just the x's you want. And we should be clear that although I'm using uh, words like property, um, this thing says set, um, you know, there can be more than one piece of evidence why the same element has the desired property, and that will give you different reasons to believe something is in the subset, and ultimately different representations for a subset element. And similarly, whilst there's no reason to believe that this function from i to x will be surjective, Hit the whole of x, there's also no reason to believe it will be injective. That's to say, you might have more than one name for the same element of x, so it might be kind of presented as in the subset in, in multiple ways. Uh, so, yeah, just to make sure that, um, that, you're, uh, that although we're using a language of, of, sort of propositional things, we're at least trying to think in a, in a proof relevant way. And then something interesting happens. Right? I mean, I say these are both notions of subset. I mean, intuitively, we can kind of see them, uh, that they are representing that concept to, to some extent. But the question is, are they the same notion of subset? Um, 
And then something quite interesting happens. A lot depends on the size of x, on the size of the thing that we're taking subsets of. If, it, if x is small, if x is our set, uh, then you get to play uh, an interesting game. You get to turn these powers into fans. So pow is the, the subset by uh, defining a property. So power shell for power. And this is the, uh, the contravariant power set functor. Uh, and then fam is like choosing a family of x's by naming the ones in the family. Uh, so for small x, if you have a suitable notion of equality, which we more or less do, uh, fam and pow, fam x and pow x are interchangeable. What, what, what's capital up arrow? Capital up arrow would like to find somewhere else. And whizzed past it to I press it full stop, but I can't. Uh, <laughs> where have I hit uh, uh, I'll tell you what capital up arrow is. So it's, it's, the, uh, it's a, a, an unfortunate side effect of the fact that ADDA uh, is not cumulative. So up arrow is the record type of, that lives in set one that store that wraps a set. So here on, so you'll notice that these definitions was there, was there a reason why they made it not key? Um, because they wanted it to be polymorphic and uh, they were scared and rightly so of trying to do universe polymorphism and cumulativity at the same time. Um, so they picked one. I think I prefer cumulativity. I um, knew it was was a many day. Uh, yeah, I think they picked the wrong one. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> pick one. Uh, yeah, so. Uh, 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 but it's a, 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 a topic for offline for uh, um, uh, what I would do instead. I have a proposal for what to do instead of universe polygon. So that you can have cumulativity. And are P to F and F to P as they you go further and show them mutually in this? Um, certainly up to isomorphism you can. Indeed. I think I did I do that? Mm. Not sure. Um, then there's a, a sort of a bit of a an interlude of of showing how our different presentations of containers uh, that we've seen so far, the Roman one and then the, the one with, this is the one we've been working with, that's the Hancock one, uh, uh, that these are just, you can get between them just by flipping fans and powers, just by saying, well, you know, this one has a fan there and that one has a power instead. Um, uh, so there's some exploration of the variations on the theme you get just by exchanging uh, fan and power. Uh, there's just a, once you get kind of turned on to it, you begin to spot the you know, a number of concepts that you encounter that look different are really just the fan and power variants of the same idea. And then you get to worry about whether it matters that they're fan and power variants the same idea. Because there's a crucial exercise 4.21, which you should all attempt, but at which you will all fail, <laughs> is to try and show how to get between fan and power when x is large. Um, uh, because then it turns out that they ain't the same. At least they are not the same in a way that you can get your hands on terribly easily. Um, and um, so that's um, that's a bit of fun, but it's also an introduction to what I meant to talk about this afternoon. Um,
Yes. Well, so far, we've been looking at, in particular, so Peterson C many trees, at least I, you know, indexed sets. They're, they are things which live in, uh, in POW. You know, POW of the index. Um, and we're making, we're figuring out uh, uh, how to define inductive data structures by taking fixed points of sufficiently well behaved functors between. I'd like to move on to talking about taking fixed points of suitably well behaved functors between fans. That's what we call induction recursion. We can say Martin Bird type theory if you remember. <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> uh, same thing. <laughs> uh, yeah, so. Um, I wanted to start with a little, uh, little thought experiment. Uh, well, it might turn into an actual experiment. Um, so we looked at um, we looked at the, the finite sets at some point. So fin n is a type with with n elements. Um, so uh, we could imagine constructing a little tiny type theory in which all the types are finite just by taking as our base types all of the thin ends, but then saying, well, suppose we close that under sigma types and pi types. You'd expect, well, the, the sum of a finite collection of finite types to be a finite type, and the products of a finite collection of finite types to be a finite type. And we can even figure out how large, I mean, in the case of sums, you actually just Add up all the sizes, right? If I offer you a choice between you know, three things or five things, that means you're being offered a choice between eight things. If I offer you the choice of one from a bunch of three things and one from a bunch of five things, then you're being offered a choice of you know, 15 different pairs. So you can do that calculation. Uh, you can generalize from the binary case to the enary case by implementing uh, sums and products. And then we can try and give a syntax for the types in this language, where the base case is just that we have enumerations of a given size, and then we want to add operators corresponding to sigma types and pi types. Just try and write the syntax of the types in the finite universe closed under sigma and pi. So, okay, so what do we do? Right, we've got the base case. Everyone happy? And then we say, well, we're going to have constructors for sigma and pi. And they'll have a domain, and that will be a type in our universe. And they'll have a range. And we need to explain what that range is in a way that is somewhat dependent on values in the um, in the domain. So we need to know what are the values in the domain. Well, if we know the sizes of these sets, then we've got a good candidate for how to represent values. If you just choose a finite set that big, then that will be good enough to represent values. So then the question we need to solve, yeah, so then we give, we can represent the range as a function from a finite set the right size, to a type for each one of those values. Um, the trouble is that we don't offhand know the size of the, uh, of the domain. Um, so um, we're kind of a little bit, bit stuck as to what to put there. Um, and the thing, if only we already knew what this type was, then we could write a function to measure the size of each of the types in the language. But the trouble is that we can't really wait until we finished defining the type to write that function, because we need that function in order to say what the type is. But it's kind of okay, because in particular, the thing we need is the size of x. But not, nothing kind of more weird. Um, so we 
at least we need to know the sizes of smaller things to say what the bigger things are. So maybe we could kind of arrange for that size to turn up just in time. That's the thing. We, we, when we make an inductive data type declaration, we're explaining how to build up values incrementally. So maybe we can arrange to say not only how to build up values incrementally, but to say what size they have alongside. That's to say we might like to build up a set and the way of measuring it to get a natural number simultaneously. That's to say we don't want to build an inductively defined set, we want to build an inductively defined fab mat. To say an inductively defined pair of a set and a function from that set to that. And that's exactly what definition by induction recursion does for us. So let me. Somebody says, 
I wish I was alive to do this, so they hack it and make it more liberal. <laughs> and then someone, my ears uh, and then someone <laughs> says, you know, proves false and says, you know, that was, uh, <laughs> that was too much. So one of the things, uh, yeah, I'm glad you asked that question in that one of the clear concerns when messing around with powerful forms of definition like this is what are the criteria for when one is okay. Uh, and uh, yeah, that we should make further inquiry into it will. Okay, uh, I'm glad I leave myself instructions. Uh, <laughs> so, yes. so okay, one thing we, um, so we, we did here was to compute the, uh, the size of the set, and that allows us then to use fin of the size as a somewhat unstructured representation of the set. I mean, it's a set of the right size, but the structure on the elements is just numerical. Um, so we might actually want, instead, um, just to choose the sets, the honest-to-goodness actor sets, that are built from uh, finite sets and uh, uh, sigma and pi. And so instead of manufacturing a fan that, to manufacture a fan set, and then the key thing I have to do here is unpack, you know, strip the fin off, so we're, we're just interpreting a, 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 an F type as a set, and then I have to put the pieces back. So there's Thin. And then this is going to be not a numerical sum, but a sigma type. And then this is going to be, um, I'll actually just give myself the corresponding pi. Well, I just do that. And we're back in the room. And something. Slightly astonishing has just happened because I mean you're not going to be surprised when when you learn that like a bunch of natural numbers turns out to be kind of small, but now I'm telling you a bunch of sets is small. No, at no point was I forced to inflate this to set one. I picked out a small subset of set itself. Even though set is large, this particular subset of set is small. And that's what induction recursion brings to the table as its sort of extra power. It, it's a kind of incredible shrinking ray that lets you carve out of large sets um, a fragment that is describable in small terms. I mean, I mean if you look at, you know, uh, that we, you know, we're just building up formulae for natural numbers and, uh, and functions that involve small sets. You know, ordinary size set, you know, this is, this is just an ordinary set, so if this is an ordinary set, why shouldn't the whole thing be an ordinary set? I mean, there's, no, there's nothing large actually being stored in here. The only thing is that we're using a small structure to represent large things, and we need to know how to interpret them as we go along, instead of after the fact. Um, but that's the... Um, uh, 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 yeah, that, that's the power of induction recursion, is letting you uh, bottle some of a large set. It's clear we haven't got the whole of set in here, otherwise we'd be in trouble. Right, yeah. In particular, this, this universe is closed under finite sets, sums and products. It is not closed under a principle of definition by induction recursion. So, uh, yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> but the point is, yeah, because Agda's set is closed under a principle of definition by induction recursion, it is really rather big. Um, uh, I mean, if you if you switch off prop in cock, you, you delete it from cock's type theory and just leave yourself cock's predicative hierarchy of type universes, that whole hierarchy would fit inside set in act. All the source of largeness in cock is from the impredicativity of prop. Because they haven't added induction recursion. Um, oh, I was going to do I was I was going to write down the 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 type representing the sum of the natural numbers from one to a hundred and uh, um, in honor of Gauss, but um, <laughs> I've, uh, uh, but I've blown that now. Um, okay, uh, yeah. So that's the game. If you want to represent uh, fragments of a dependent type system, induction recursion is very often the thing that you need, precisely because you have dependent types, so you need to know what the types that you've represented mean in time to say how things are allowed to depend on them. <laughs> you want to, uh, yeah, here's a representation of a type, and then you want to talk about types which depend on values in whatever it was you represented. You need to know whatever that was sooner rather than later, even just to say what what you're representing. It's a pretty useful concept. How, how do those cockers and cockettes get away with not having it? A badly? <laughs> <laughs> um, um, uh, yeah, so, um, I mean, in terms of uh, pulling reflective stones, I should, of course, add that. Uh, as you might expect, might expect from the fact that pow and fam are interchangeable for small arguments, that if your inductive recursive set is, you know, if, if the interpretation is small, then you can easily turn it into an index family at the same size. Uh, so the version we had with, with NAT here could be re-engineered as an inductive family indexed by NAT up front. And that's just uh, uh, flipping from fan to pow uh, when small. But once it's large, no can do. So what you can do in cock for a situation like this is write down an inductive family in set one indexed by set. That is the sort of large predicate that a set is representable in this form. But that's at a definite inflationary cost in the set theoretic science of the thing. What's remarkable about induction recursion is that this is small. Um, Okay, um, I want to have a quick look. One, one of the early uses for as sort of representational purposes of, uh, of induction recursion, which kind of broke uh, in the, the late 90s, uh, was to represent uh, the, uh, the subset of our sets in type theory that correspond to record types, the types given by some sort of record signature. And in particular, uh, Randy Pollock spent years writing and revising a paper which examined the use of records for mathematical structure. And he was trying to model um, presentations of records uh, in type theory. And he considered these two presentations of records, which you can think of as being uh, right 
like right nested records and left nested records. Um, and uh, so what you have the right nested record, it's a bit like a cut down fragment of our descriptions. You say in a left to right way what the, what the types of the fields are. You're either done or you have a, a record with a first field and you say what set that is. And then you say how the rest of the record structure depends on a value in that field. Um, so, uh, yeah, so that, that gives you a kind of notion of a telescope getting more and more dependent, except sometimes it's not the thing that you want. It's sort of too flexible. You can see that you're free to choose the whole of the record structure depending on uh, the value of the first field. So uh, if you ever wanted to sort of make use of some uniformity in that structure, it's difficult to do so. I mean, in particular, um, uh, if we want to write, to take a record type and tell, tell us how many fields there are in it, so it's not going to happen. Indeed, uh, we can construct a record whose first field is a natural number uh, and uh, whose uh, subsequent record structure has that many fields, right? <laughs> so size is not going to happen here. You can instead, though, you can compute the size of an individual record, but the record type as a whole uh, doesn't have uh, a uniform notion of size. Yeah, so here's the interpretation for right nested records, just as, as right nested signal types. Yeah, so you can compute a size for an individual record and then explain how to project from it. But uh, what, you, what you do not have is uh, sort of the exact analog of a sequence of a, of a signature where you present a fixed number of uh, field declarations uh, where later fields can depend on earlier fields. Right? You can do much more exotic things than that with right next to records. That's the point. Whereas, with the left nested uh, records, you get a much more restricted situation. So these are the, um, the, the left nested records. There's an empty record, and now we're growing from the right. And in order to grow on the right, we need to know we, the, the type of the new field can depend on the whole of the previous record. So we need the interpretation uh, of uh, what's to the left of us in advance. And that's why this uh, notion of leftness record has to be given by induction recursion. What's the implicit parameter n for? Oh, that's just me being stupid. Um, and that means that something else needs to, um, uh, let me make a note of that, because um, that's, I was at one stage thinking of making these sized records, uh, actually, because the point is you can, yeah. uh, they do have a notion of size, um, uh, and later on uh, I do use size. But yeah, at this point. Um, so it's of course possible to index them by size. You could index them by size. With right nested records, you could also index them by size. Um, uh, you could say, well, you know, no matter which, you know, no matter in what way yeah. uh, the record structure depends on A, it has to have this size, and then you would recover some of that. Uh, uh, 
But uh, yeah, uh, in this situation, uh, you get you get something that's much more like a context in a dependent type theory. You get uh, you grow it up the right hand end, and uh, effectively you say how the type of the new entry can depend on any environment for the previous context. And you can see. Uh, again, we're now building that up with, with left nested sigma types. Uh, so if you wanted to split a context somewhere in the middle, would you have a, a right thing on the right and a left thing on the left? Uh, I'm trying to remember what exercises did I set. Oh, I, I set so these ones. Uh, one advantage of, uh, of left nested records is that you can truncate them very easily. So for example, if you've added a bunch of extra fields to make a substructure and you want to throw them away again, uh, then uh, because the, basically, the, the new stuff is at the right hand end, it's easier to drop them. Whereas uh, it's, uh, it's rather tricky to truncate uh, rightness records. Uh, and in any case, expensive. It's not just a projection, it's a, uh, it's a copy of the brick shape. Uh, but yes, in terms of wanting to be able to say, uh, uh, to, to sort of split records into pieces, the uniformity of uh, left-listed records is uh, a considerable benefit. Let me just advertise an exercise. Um, uh, namely, uh, this one. Uh, where I, this is where I really did go with sizes. So these are an extension of the left nested records where some of the fields are what Randy calls manifest. That's to say, you not only write places where values go in records, but you can also give fields that already have a definition that are generated in a particular way from the earlier parts of the record. So it's like having a context which has some definitions in it, as well as some abstractions. Um, and uh, because I want to make sure that even though the thing is defined, it really is stored in the record, uh, I introduced this, um, uh, this type of, of manifest values. So thinking manifest three, can only be a copy of three. But there really is a thing itself stored. Um, uh, so then when I'm interpreting the constructor that says, you know, not only are you going to tell me the type of this field, but you're going to give me the way to compute a value, I mean, the way to compute the value of the field. Um, then when we interpret that, we really say, well, you know, the thing that actually goes in the record has to be uh, the, um, uh, the manifest value computed by A. Um, and then, uh, so, well, if, if I made A a parameter instead of an argument in manifest, what would go wrong? Uh, well, so the things that go left of the colon, yeah. some of which are, um, well, yes, in this case it would be a parameter. Uh, yeah, so the point is they're not actually stored. Uh, you wouldn't be able to get access to it by pattern matching. Uh, and yeah. okay. I'm very, you know, I, uh, um, yeah, okay. Uh, I'm, uh, <laughs> In the manipulations that you, you should be doing, you should actually, I mean, it's, you can solve the problem by being computing. Uh, but what would be the point of that? I mean, it's, like, it's in the record, right? <laughs> Why be computed? Um, uh, but then, here's, here's the fun thing. I ask you to define a kind of theory morphism type. And here's a very kind of primitive, boring notion of theory morphism. Um, but 
but uh, yeah, so the idea is that you should explain under what circumstances you can take a record type and add more information to it. What are the ways of adding more information to a record? Uh, and then clearly if you're adding strictly more information you ought to be able to define a forgetful map that throws the extra stuff away. So for every way you can build, turn, extend R to R prime, there should be a function back the way from R prime records to R records. And I've kicked off with the tedious and not very useful observation that the empty record extends the empty record. <laughs> um, uh, and indeed, when we get the empty tuple back, we map it to the empty tuple. Shocking, right? <laughs> but I suggest other things you might like to be able to do, like you know, turning abstract fields into manifest fields, or throwing in new fields, or, or whatever it happens to be. Uh, but this is a, a, an exercise in the sort of malleability of, uh, of left nested records and uh, sort of representation of uh, kind of theory morphisms for, uh, for want of a, a better word. Um, okay. Uh, so I've got one minute in which to create a cliffhanger for the next <laughs> uh, for the next lecture. I was going to write this live, um, but I don't have time. Uh, so we already saw one small set closed under finite sets and uh, sigma and pi. Um, so I thought I'd make that slightly more interesting. Um, well, I thought all the finite sets is a bit, that's a bit superfluous. Uh, I'm going to throw in um, uh, 0, 1, and 2. Uh, I could have got away with just 0 and 2. But, you know, 1 is um, uh, And then I thought I'd throw in the uh, Fetterson scenic trees. Um, uh, I could have just thrown in W types, but then you'd have to do an encoding of anything that you want to work with, where it's nice just to be able to write them down directly. Um, uh, if this is a bit forbidding, it's just, a, uh, it's just a, another way of writing down indexed containers. Uh, you choose a type of indices, and then given an index, you choose a set of shapes represented in the universe, and then, given a shape, you choose a representative of the positions. And then, given a position, you say what index it has. So all I've done is undone that lambda lifting that meant, you know, our, um, uh, you know, we had uh, shapes that took an index, positions that took an index and a shape, uh, and uh, the uh, 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 element index function taking all three things. Yeah, so when we come to interpret these codes for sets, you take the zero code to zero, one code to one, two code to two, sigma code to sigma, pi code to pi, and uh, then um, we reconstitute the, um, uh, the index container that's been described by this bunch of stuff. But you see, up here, no occurrence of anything like set, and indeed that TU, the tree universe, is small, and although it's small, it's nonetheless you know, full of yummy types that we, we like programming with. It's quite a lot like, it's got all the types we used in the first half of the course, right? Not quite, that's a good quality, but maybe it'll get <laughs> so, so, um, there's some amusing stuff here about how to build hierarchies of the universe. 
of universities, which I encourage you to explore. And yeah, I will need to talk about encoding, induction, and coaching, and I'll do that at the start of the next lecture. But yeah, that's induction recursion and its use in managing record structures and in building small encoding 